Uh, let's see, I designed this program as an engineer who uh, got into solar and eventually you work in solar long enough and someone wants you to go and pass the master electrician exam. So, you know, while it's a, a, the best thing for doing electrical work and learning electrical is probably to go through, you know, the traditional, you know, four out, four year, you know, apprentice, journeyman, master electrician route, um, as design engineers, as design professionals, we're often asked to spec out uh, and do preliminary design. And with solar and batteries becoming that much more important in building design, you know, your building designers are asked to get into more and more detail. And then eventually, before the project gets started, it's best to get through a detailed design process that gets the uh, construction to go that much more smoothly. And so uh, this, this program is kind of intended for building professionals to brush up on their electric code knowledge and to also gain a better understanding of uh, you know, how electricity works and why the, why the code is there to begin with. So you know, there's, there's a lot to National Electric Code. I think what's, what's interesting is you know, we, we, half of code is or even even three quarters of code uh, or even even more than that is just for general case uses for general electrical wiring and then the remaining bits of code towards the end are for special use cases and solar and batteries you know they they do fit into those special use cases and there are you know, dedicated sections of code just for solar, just for batteries. And so when you're getting into solar and batteries, you generally start with the specialty and try and do like brute force memorization of what the special rules or regulations of electrical design are. As I got more into uh, broader design scope and preparing for the master electrician exam you know you have to know the rest of code and what i what i came to discover is electric code is very repetitive so a lot of the the special rules or what i thought was special uh, that would pop up and say the solar section actually occur in the previous sections and they just reiterate it in the solar section uh, maybe with a slight variant. There might be a additional thing you do with solar. Uh, but what I found is by understanding the first parts of code, you have to you you begin to not need to memorize code. And instead, you just develop a comprehensive understanding of what you know safe electrical design is and why things are the way they are. So that improves your design practice rather than just trying to you know, copy someone's homework by hanging out in the, the tail end of code without getting into uh, the brass tacks of the earlier sections. And so we're gonna focus a lot on those earlier sections, particularly in today's program. Now, <laughs> There's a, something that's a little bit frustrating about National Electric Code, which is that it is not a, a governmental code. It's not like there's a, a federal National Electric Code office and they publish National Electric Code. Uh, National Electric Code is actually owned by a private organization whose goal it is is to publish a, a standard of safe practices for electricity. And then they, they allow local governments to adopt their National Electric Code as the official standard. And so some states don't even have National Electric Code. I'm webcasting from Mississippi right now, and there's no official uh, adoption of National Electric Code in Mississippi. However, uh, when you're doing energy projects and you do get some sort of inspection, 
you know, they're, they're still going to look for National Electric Code compliance, even if, um, you know, even if they haven't come out right and said, you know, you must use National Electric Code. It still is, it still is a, a standard to follow even where it's not required. And what we have to remember about National Electric Code is its goal is really to define not best practices, but instead a, a bare minimum level of safety. And so if you're violating National Electric Code, uh, you're, you're probably doing something that is not right or not safe. If there's an instance where you might think, oh, well, National Electric Code requires this, but should I do something above and beyond what it requires? The answer is, yeah, you know, there, there could be uh, better ways and even more solid ways to do your electrical design than simply what National Electric Code requires. You know, the you know, one, one kind of case in point I'm thinking about is, is grounding. There's a lot of different ways to clamp your ground to the ground rod. You know, one way is to, to kind of weld the uh, connection, and that makes a very tight, solid, you know, not coming apart connection. Another way is to use a little clamp that screws between the ground wire and the ground rod. And, you know, if that clamp comes kind of loose over time, it could cause a problem. You know, so there's certain soils that are less conductive uh, than others. And so if you're in a, a, a dry, hard, uh, soil that doesn't have good conductivity, you might think, oh, well, should I should I drive, you know, two ground rods and kind of put them, you know, near each other to have one be a, a redundant ground rod? It might not be a, a bad idea to do that. You know, what National Electric Code is trying to define is is a, a minimum threshold. Because National Electric Code is put out by a private organization, it can be hard to find uh, the actual text of National Electric Code unless you actually go to the bookstore and, and buy the code book. And that is by purpose. You know, National Electric Code says, you know, you can only refer to it by reference. You cannot, you know, I, and, and so when I'm creating a class for National Electric Code, it puts me in a tough spot where, you have to teach code, but you're not really allowed just to give out, you know, the, the sections of the code that you need to, uh, to study it. So, you know, the, the best way to learn National Electric Code is to actually have a, a code book with you uh, to get the full text. You're not just going to find copies of the text around the Internet. In fact, if you do, those copies are not supposed to be distributed in that manner. And so, uh, you know, for that matter, you know, following National Electric Code does not exempt you from the liability associated with your project, uh, nor is the organization behind National Electric Code assuming liability for your project. This is a little obvious. When, when performing electrical design, it, it's good to be aware of your environment. And what I mean by that is a lot of electrical devices will have ratings and many will be only for dry environments versus wet environments. And so, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about um, EMT metal conduit. You, you, you attach two EMT metal conduits together with a component called a coupling. Well, you walk into Home Depot and you buy EMT conduit and you buy the EMT conduit couplings, you know, more than likely the EMT conduit couplings are gonna be rated for dry conditions, which would be fine if you're doing the installation indoors. They might even be rated for a, a, a damp condition but you go to an electrical supply house, you can buy an EMT conduit coupling that is rated as a rain-tight coupling. And 
where would you use a, a rain tight coupling? Well, you know, outside where it rains and solar being on a roof is outside. It's a wet location. And so you can kind of get in trouble if you're doing like a do it yourself solar project by just walking into Home Depot and, and buying whatever's off the shelf. Uh, because there might, there's, it's, I've never seen a rain tight coupling in Home Depot. I've only gotten them at my electrical supply house. And so if you're not aware of the environmental ratings of the products you're selecting, you can get into trouble when it comes time to actually locating those, those products. Um, solar inverters and, and, in particular, battery inverters can have wildly different uh, environmental ratings. Usually the, the top shelf inverters have outdoor ratings, but not always. Um, no, another thing about those ratings that is good to keep in mind is that those ratings are, are only there for when the product is actually installed. If you have an outdoor rated device, but the connections aren't made up yet, you know, water can still impact those connections and get into them. Um, so just because you have an outdoor or wet rated device doesn't mean that you, you can't ignore uh, what's actually going on on, on site. <clears throat> you know, uh, gases that have deteriorating effects. So some batteries produce uh, kind of a... Uh, 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 nauseous gases that have to be vented to the outside. Well, if you have a battery bank that's emitting gases, that is such a, a explosive gas that you want to vent it to the outside. Well, then the the metal around that battery bank uh, needs to have a, a, a surface treatment on it to avoid the corrosion. Temperature ratings are a a Another critical thing to check when designing a solar array, you know, solar cable is rated for high temperature. You know, that's because solar is on a roof and it gets very hot on a roof. So solar panels, solar cable, solar components are rated for high temperature. But if you walk into your hardware store and buy a junction box, or a disconnect switch, it often will not have that high temperature rating that solar does. It might have a, a lower temperature rating because the manufacturer of that disconnect switch is not assuming that you're gonna go put that disconnect switch up on the rooftop. So being aware of your temperature ratings and getting them all to match is a good rule of thumb. Um, and, and if you don't get them all to match, you have to use the lowest temperature rating for your calculations to make sure you're not exceeding that. We're going to get into what those temperature ratings mean and what the charts and National Electric Code actually mean uh, as, as classes moves on. So what, what is the, the difference between a damp environment and a wet environment well damp environments can be outdoors but they need to have protection from rain and so you know uh if you're if you're uh, in a covered garage or a covered porch that can be a, a damp environment rather than a wet environment you know if you're planning a conduit run to come out the eve of a house and it's your conduit's then going to run down the side of the house from the from the roof down the side. Maybe a few inches tucked away underneath the eave, you could argue for a damp environment. But something further down the wall would get you into a wet environment. Um, and and then other you know uh, concrete slabs in contact to the earth are are wet environments. Uh, areas exposed to water saturation are wet environments. So, you know, the wall can is a wet environment. Uh, you know, sprinkler systems can turn dry environments into wet environments. You know, so so for the most part, if you're outside, you're in a wet environment 
but there are certain areas that you could argue to the inspector, you know, no, for the first couple of inches tucked up underneath this eave, that's protected from rainfall. And so that's a, a damp environment. And the, the reason for that discussion is you can get away with different kinds of material selection for a, a damp environment versus a, a wet environment. And so the, the cable that I like to use for my wire runs through the attic is actually rated for a damp environment. And so I'll run that cable through the attic and I'll stick it out the underside of the eave. And then I'll transition and I'll put a, a box underneath the eave and then transition the wire in that box to something a little bit more you know, appropriate for a wet environment. So the, the question becomes, where do you make the transition? If you have to transition your cable and conduit runs from a dry environment, such as inside the building to a wet environment outside the building, how do you do that in a code compliant manner, uh, but not have, you know, but keep your transitions outside the house? So sometimes uh, a, a, a more detailed understanding of the weather rated conditions of your balance of system material can make the installation go a lot more smooth. Uh, particularly because attics, uh, particularly around the edge of the attic where the roof meets the wall, uh, you don't have much space to work in. And so it, it'd be a lot easier to stick a ladder up the side of the wall outside the building and put a box there rather than, you know, in a confined space. And so here we have uh, just some pictures to show, you know, yes, solar is a... a wet conditioned environment, you know, inside the attic is a, a dry conditioned environment. And so often solar will have a, a, a specialty junction box and you can just come down the back of the box into the attic. Um, you know, and indoors would be a dry location. So the attic is a dry location. The roof is a wet location. Uh, electric code says the temperature rating associated with the ampacity of conductor shall not exceed the lowest temperature rating of any connector termination conductor uh, or device. And, and essentially what that means is if you're using, say, a 90C conductor on a and landing it on a box that only has a 75C terminal, so 90C is greater than 75C, something that's rated for 90C has a higher temperature rating than something that's rated for 75C. So what does it mean when you, when you take a, a high temperature solar cable and you land it on a lower temperature rated disconnect switch yeah, you know, what you need to do is do all your ampacity calculations at 75C to make sure that you're not exceeding the ampacity of that terminal block on the disconnect switch. You know, what it's also telling us is that higher temperatures uh, are, are more of a safety hazard than lower temperatures. And so that also kind of implies that if you're if you're locating an electrical box in an outdoor environment, you know, give consideration to where that box is going to go. You know, if you take the south side of the building versus the east or the west side of the building, you know, which side of the building has the greatest exposure to direct sunlight? You know, the south side of the building. And so, you know, it's not uh, even though you might have an outdoor rated high temperature rated device. Uh, it is better to avoid mounting that equipment to the south side of the building. It's better to put it on the north side of the building where it's going to be shaded. Um, and so, so that's where you get into select you know, the value of solar specialty equipment. So this is uh, this box right here on the rooftop. Let me get my uh, drawing tools out. This this box right here, 
is this box right here. And uh, you know what is this? This is a solar specialty component that you have to order ahead of time. Uh, that you you know can't just walk into Home Depot and buy. And what what so there's some some form factor advantages of this particular transition box. You know, one is that you know junction boxes that you find at Home Depot are often six inches deep, and so yeah, I like tucking my transition boxes underneath the array rather than out at the edge of the array. I like putting them underneath the array because they're not exposed to sunlight. I like putting them underneath the array because they're going to be protected from some rainfall. Um, so there's a, a form factor advantage in that this box is a, a slimmer profile so that it can be tucked underneath a solar array on the rooftop, whereas a, a generic junction box from the box store might not physically fit. But another advantage of this particular junction box is that it will come with a, a, a temperature rating that is the same as the solar cable. And so you can do all of your National Electric Code and Pasadena calculations at the same temperature rating. You know, if this box did not have a 90C temperature rating and I did all of my calculations based off a of 90C temperature rating and this box or disconnect switch or service panel only had a 75C terminal rating, but I didn't check and I'm going and maxing out my ampacity at the 90C rating, what's going to happen is these terminal blocks are going to heat up and they can start smoldering the cable and you know, potentially cause a fire just because of the heat on that box. And so National Electric Code has tables of temperature correction in them. And I, I when when I started looking at these sheets, it's like, okay, well, there's there's a couple of different ratings. You know, there's a, a 60C rating, a 75C rating, and a 90C rating. And and it's like, okay, well, what's the difference between this temperature rating and then the other axis is the ambient temperature? And and basically you say, you know, okay, well, if if I'm in Houston, Texas, and I know outside it's going to get up to 120 or 130 degrees. You know, if I'm using 90C cable, I'm deducting 76% off of that ampacity. If I'm using 75C rated cable, you know, it's, it's here's the thing. It's like 90C or 200 degree Fahrenheit cable, it's rated for 200 degrees Fahrenheit. So it can operate when ambient temperatures are 120 to 130 without issue. You know, 75C and 60C, you can say, okay, well, it's rated for 140 or 167, so surely it could go into a environment whose temperature is less than the temperature rating of the wires. Well, you know, you're forgetting a few things. You know, a black wire can absorb heat, and then there's the heat of the electricity flowing inside that wire and so they're saying, no, you know, if it's if it's operating at an ambient of 120 or 130, and it could have further elevated temperatures because of the current and resistance inside that cable, we need to give you enough enough spare capacity in that cable so that that resistance of the electrical flow through the cable doesn't heat the cable to the point where the combination of the ambient temperature and the resistance in the cable gets you beyond the temperature rating of the cable and the cable starts to burn up. And so like Romex is a, a good case in point. You know, Romex is a, a common AC cable where the contractors just wire your, your cable through your house. It's commonly in Romex and that's done. You know, Romex is a, a 60 C temperature rated cable. 
And so if I were to use a 60C rated cable and I managed to find an outdoor version of it, you know, given my ambient temperature, you know, I might, because of that lower temperature rating, I'm having to leave a lot of spare capacity in that, that cable. I'm having to discount the ampacity of that cable. If it's 30 amp cable, I could only use 12 amps of it if I'm trying to use it outdoors at elevated temperatures. And so what these, what these charts encode are for is to prevent you from actually having to go and do that detailed engineering calculation to say, well, gee, if it's this hot outside, I'm pulling this many amps and the cross section of my conductor is this wide and the, the resistance of the copper or aluminum is this value, what will the internal temperature of the conductor be? You know, instead of going through that process for every wire that you ever encounter, you know, the National Electric Code says, now, wait a minute, <laughs> these aren't like electrical engineers who are picking out the wires and wiring them up in our houses. They're more contractors who want to, you know, get on and off the job site in a, a quick manner, uh, but also not be exposed to the liability of unsafe installations. And so what National Electric Code has done is develop these charts as like fudge factors or cheat sheets to say, you don't need to perform these calculations. If you're using 90C wire and it's going to be in an environment where the ambient temperature is 120 to 130, then take the 90C wire and, and discount it by 24% uh, and stay within that discounted ampacity uh, as far as temperature correction factor goes, there might be other correction factors to consider, but you know, stay within that ampacity and you'll be fine. Now, I think it's kind of important to hammer home the fact that solar is done in hot environments so that you don't go to a box store and buy just off the shelf cable that doesn't have a high temperature rating because you're eager to run out and do your project, you know, that you have respect for uh, buying cable that has more robust cable jackets than normal wiring because solar is in a more extreme environment. And so PV watts, we talk about it in other classes. It's a, a energy estimator that's based off of uh, local weather data. And what I think is interesting about PV watts is you can go and download not just the month by month, you know, chart of how much energy a solar array will produce, but you can also download the hourly data so that you can get site specific data. So PV watts, it's it's very easy just to end on the final screen. And if you just Google PV watts, it'll pull up. And it's PV watts is put out by the government, uh, by the Department of Energy. So it's a, a free software. It's very easy to use. You put in your array size, uh, some very high level site details, and it gives you an energy estimate of how much energy the array will produce. You go and download the hourly results, and what one of the columns will actually give you is ambient temperature. And what I think is particularly interesting is it will convert, it'll give you not just ambient temperature, it'll also give you what the temperature of the solar panel itself will be up on a rooftop when exposed to the ambient temperature over a, a longer period of time. So we can see the cell temperature kind of climbing as the day continues. So not only will it, will it give you ambient temperature information, but it'll help you understand how ambient temperature can, can convert into even further elevated temperatures of the components themselves. So National Electric Code is saying, you know, at a 120 degree day, you have to discount this cable by even more than that because the temperature of the cable you know, could be even greater than ambient.
And of course, uh, Celsius, uh, this is the United States. So we don't have a good grasp of what Celsius actually means. You know, in, in Phoenix, Arizona, you go and run a PV watts calculation uh, and on a hundred degree ambient day outside, the cell temperature, the, the temperature of that rooftop, the temperature of that solar panel on a hundred degree day can exceed 160 degrees Fahrenheit. And so you go back and, and, and look at these charts, you know, all of a sudden, you know, once, once you get much past, uh, you know, all of a sudden these, these options down below start to kind of disappear <laughs> because if we went and used a, a 140 rated degree cable, you know, on a roof where the ambient temperature gets to be, you know, in, in the summertime in Phoenix, you can have a 120 degree day. You know, what we're, what we're really seeing is that the temperature of the cable, um, you know, just even without any current in it can get right up to that maximum rating. And so they're saying, you know, if you're using, you know, this low temperature cable in this high temperature environment, we're going to be discounting the amperage that goes through it so heavily that the current isn't going to be a contributing factor to the temperature of that cable. Uh, spaces. Dedicated spaces for electrical room layouts. Uh, can be kind of a, a subject of neglect. Um, the, the basic rule of thumb when planning your electrical spaces is to imagine a worker standing right in front of it saying, does that worker have enough space to comfortably work? And if the answer is yes, you're on the right path. And if the answer is no, you're probably not you're you're probably facing an electric code violation so here is a a electrical control room and it's a little messy i'll give you I'll give you that the question is does is there an electric code violation you know in this room you can say, okay, well, the one one rule of uh, uh, one kind of hard rule is that electrical space needs to be dedicated. You can't have gas lines running through your electrical space. You can't have plumbing lines. You can't even have HVAC lines running through your electrical space. You can have any electrical stuff running through your electrical space, but you can't have other scope running through your electrical space. Uh, a, common, a common violation that I see is um, outside, if you're putting your solar inverter on the wall outdoors, sometimes people will locate it a little bit too close to the, where the gas meter goes inside the building. So often your utilities are kind of grouped together. So if you have a home that has gas, uh, the gas will go into the building kind of near where the electrical goes into the building. And so you can start getting a little too close to each other. Um, but, you know, it's not it's not a, a terrible rule. You know, I'm a little concerned about this this air conditioner unit being too close to my electrical space. Um, you know, I would say that this is is dedicated electrical space and this space over here is where your plumbing is so they're they're two distinct locations now you're not allowed to use that electrical space as storage so the real code violation is just the the stuff that's there in front of the electric service panel but as long as that electric serve electric space is 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 open and clean and there's no other scope inside of it you're doing pretty good and then the the code rules are basically about defining 
you know, what a comfortable working space is. So, for example, the height of that working space is uh, the, the minimum of six and a half feet or the height of the equipment. So if you're in a big control room and you have a big service panel that's 10 feet tall, you know, the height is 10 feet and anything directly above 10 feet does not need to be taken into that working space. The, the minimum is six and a half feet. And so, you know, lo and behold, you go into this electrical room and you measure the six and a half foot space between the floor and that air duct, you get to be right at six and a half feet because six and a half feet will be from here down. Now, I recently did an off-grid house where we tucked the batteries into their own little alcove, uh, their own little room uh, that was built off the side of the building. And it, it turns out that room was an electrical code violation. Now, in our, our, you know, for our project, the inspector didn't really care but potentially, you know, the problem with our alcove, it was only, you know, it's only about five feet, you know, maybe nine inches tall. And it becomes uncomfortable to go get into that alcove and work there because you got to be hunched over. You know, that, that space was not large enough for some, a worker to stand right in front of the working space and do their job. And so, you know, not all not all rooms can be converted into battery storage or electrical rooms or inverter rooms uh, because they, if you know, if they have a low ceiling that's not tall enough to stand in, you know, your little your it, it would be more code compliant to have a box that's detached from the building where there's open airspace ahead of you rather than to tuck the batteries into you know an alcove kind of in the building foundation uh, if that alcove is not going to be tall enough for someone to stand and work in you know when you when you go in uh, the the width of the space I kind of feel like people pay the most amount of attention to whereas it's it's really the easiest one to to meet. The width of the space is 30 inches or the width of the equipment. So if you have equipment that is four feet wide, your dedicated space does not need to be one inch to the right or one inch to the left. Your dedicated space is four feet wide. If you have a four foot wide piece of equipment, the assumption is you know a human is not four foot wide. So a human can stand in front of that four foot wide equipment and work it. You don't need space to the right or the left. But if your equipment is only one foot wide, you know, your, your humans are not one foot wide. They're a little, they're a little wider than that. So, you know, on a, on a narrow piece of equipment, you need a minimum of 30 inches of dedicated space so that a person can stand in front of it and, and work it. And that, that space can start from the edge of the equipment and extend to, you know, here's your electrical box and the, the, the space can extend to the right, or you could start right, right on the edge of the other side and extend the space to the left. You know, all you need is just 30 inches total. It could be, you could split the middle. 30 inches, there could be six inches on one side and six inches on the other, of, you know, and, and you'd be just, just all right for your piece of equipment. Um, so we got the height, six and a half feet. We got the width of your working space, which is a minimum of 30 inches. The depth of the space, it, there's actually two different depth requirements. And what we're talking about with, with depth in this case is if, if this is an overhead view and this is a wall and here's your box coming off of the wall, the depth is how much space do you need 
behind the 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 person who's kind of working. <laughs> That's a a person who's has a little bald spot. <laughs> Is working in front of the box. How much space does he need behind him to work safely? And there's there's a table in National Electric Code that defines this for a different couple of cases. You know the 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 first case is you know if you don't have anything behind you, <laughs> you don't need that much depth. You can your your equip your dedicated equipment space only needs to be about three feet if there's nothing behind you. You're like, okay, well, what does that mean? If there's nothing behind me, I only need three feet behind me. Well, that's the thing about your storage areas. You know, if you wanted to have a, some, a, a walkway or a, or a storage area, um, you know, the, a, whatever, you know, you, you need three feet of dedicated space behind you to stand in front of that equipment if there's no like wall behind you. Now, if there is a wall behind you, they say, well, how much space do you need if there's nothing behind you versus a wall behind you? And if there's a wall behind you, you need a little bit more space than if there's nothing behind you. So this chart is, is the, for the depth of your working space, it kind of quibbles between three feet and four feet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, is that really big? Can't you just allow four feet behind you in all circumstances? Sure. The National Electric Code is not trying to define the you know, safer practices. They're trying to define the bare minimum. You know, so three feet with no wall, three and a half feet with a wall. Can you imagine a circumstance where you would need something more than three and a half feet? Let's say there's a wall behind you. The main difference is what's on that wall behind you. Behind you, is there just a plain empty wall that you can lean on and back up against and give yourself a back rub, scratch your back on it? Or is that wall full of electrical equipment? You know, are you in a, a control room and you have an inverter here and you want to know how much space can I have between that inverter and another inverter? Well, National Electric Code says if you have an obstruction behind you and it is electrical equipment, then the space of that dedicated working area needs to be four feet. And so it's like if, if it's electrical equipment behind you, they don't want you to back into it and electrocute yourself. So they need more space than if there's no electrical equipment behind you. Now, National Electric Code is, is pretty obvious stuff if you, if you think through on why the rules exist. And that way, you don't have to memorize all these rules for the exam. You know, you can say, okay, the question on the exam says uh, there's electrical equipment behind me or no electrical equipment behind me. And I know more or less you need to have between three to four feet. And so, you know, you can figure out what the right answer is based on, you know, knowing that the, the you know, there's, there's more feet required because there's electrical space behind you rather than it being an open air. <clears throat> and what that'll enable you to do is start planning, you know, your, your battery rooms a little bit more easily. Um, you know, batteries, take up a lot of space, you know, in solar, we're not used to really having too much space requirements because in, in old school batteryless solar, you know, you just hang one piece of equipment on the wall and that's it. Well, you know, as solar policy is redefined to start kind of forcing solar owners into battery ownership, all of a sudden the space requirements of these systems grow a lot larger. So you have to start thinking, you know, oh, is my battery inverter rated for outdoors? If I put it inside a storage room, 
you know, then then I'm going to have to have dedicated space. <laughs> if my battery wall is here, then, you know, it's an empty room, so I just have three feet of dedicated space here. You know, if my battery bank is this wide, I can have a desk or a water tank, you know, right next to it because my dedicated working space is three feet, you know, is, is, is wide enough for someone to walk up and down this area and, and work without obstruction. So all these clearance requirements are are based around obstruction. I think the 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 last one, here we go. This I probably should have put a little bit further. The last kind of space or clearance requirement to be aware of is not the the working space, but the amount of overhang one piece of equipment can overhang from the other. And so in, in this instance, it could be tempting to put all of your, you know, ignore that freezer section. In this case, it could be tempting to put all of your equipment along one wall of the room because it's more compact and it'll take up less space than, say, putting the inverter wall along one section and putting the batteries along the other section. So it could be, be very tempting to say, well, let's just put them all on the same wall. You know, the problem that you can see here is that this, this electrical component and the batteries overhang from each other. And so, okay, well, you can put a piece of electrical equipment on a wall, and you can put another piece of electrical equipment underneath it and share that electrical space. But one piece of equipment cannot extend out from the wall by more than six inches as compared to the other piece of equipment that it overhangs. And the reason is, if I have to go and work inside this electrical box and my batteries are sticking out a foot, you know, out, protruding a foot out from that piece of equipment, now, if someone is is standing, you know, in front of and here's my spider person. <laughs> if one person is standing in front of the battery, now they have to lean over to access that equipment. They could fall into the battery below it. If it's an electrical box on the wall, they could put their elbow on it and shove it off the wall. That could cause some problems. I mean, it's it's just not safe to be leaning over other electrical devices to work on something that you need to have access to. And so particularly with unsealed batteries, you know, with batteries that you have to do maintenance for, with batteries that you need to water, such as forklift batteries. And these batteries are becoming less and less popular. You know, they still have some uses, although personally I'm kind of moving now away from, I've, I've been a big advocate for industrial flooded lead acid batteries for a very long time. But now the, the price of, of lithium ion batteries are, is, is starting to drop substantially. Uh, particularly with the electric vehicle batteries that are now finding secondary market applications to the point where, uh, you know, we're, we're pretty much right at the point where you have to choose between uh, getting a brand new flooded lead acid battery or spending less money and getting a used lithium ion battery, such as a lithium ion battery that was involved in a car crash uh, where the car was totaled, but the lithium ion battery bank was fine, you know, that might get sold, tested, and then resold to a secondary market. And so I'm, I'm starting to, to move away from unsealed batteries. But with unsealed batteries, you have all these little ports inside the battery bank that you have to add water to, which means you need to be able to walk around all sides of the battery. So one code question that could be, 
um, you know, a, a array layout, a r- battery room layout would be how far away from this wall does this battery bank need to be in order to to have enough dedicated space about the equipment to adequately service it? And the answer would be, you know, since this is a wall with no electrical on it, that that spacing would have to be three and a half feet. You know, the what's the, what's the difference in distance between you know this inverter wall and this battery bank? Well, since they're both electrical equipment, this space right here has to be four feet. And so this is this the, these pictures I think are humorous uh, in part because I pulled them off the battery manufacturer's website and they're putting these these photos up there as like examples of what your battery inverter room could look like. And then you know we know <laughs> that this is a code violation because you would have to lean over these batteries to access the service panel. Now we know this is a code violation. You know what they've what they've done here is they've said, okay, well this is not enough space between the wall, you know, between the battery and the inverter. So we have to put a protective barrier there, a wall there. And but of course the problem is, you know, that that gets you from a four foot spacing requirement to a three and a half foot spacing requirement. And just uh, to my naked eye right here. I don't think that that's three and a half feet. I think that they they recognize the safety hazard to say we need to put in a wall there so if someone's standing here, they're not backing into the electrical equipment, uh, but they still didn't leave themselves uh, enough adequate space <coughs> to uh, work that area. And so I guess where where I'm kind of coming around on on unsealed batteries is now I instead of putting the batteries like the way they have them where the the long end of the battery is up against the wall you know you still have to service the cells of the battery back here and so you put them up against the wall like that it's space compact but now you can't access the back of the battery for maintenance or servicing and and so instead of putting the long end up against the wall i'll put the short end up against the wall and then the rest of the battery will be kind of sticking out into the middle of the room so that you can access the battery on three out of four sides as being kind of the most space compact configuration I'll back up a minute. You know, so here's here's an example of um, industrial flooded lead acid batteries. You know, often you're taking a, a 12 volt battery bank and you're installing four of them to get up to 48 volts. And so these, when we kind of talk about these batteries in the off grid residential class. Uh, but what I want to point out is like batteries are large. You know, these these you might need to to run an average house off of, of this particular flooded lead acid battery. Uh, you conservatively you need about eight of these, you know, eight of these if it's a large house, eight of these if it's a small house, you know, or anywhere in between. And so what we might have are two. 48 volt batteries in parallel with each other and so you say okay well you know these batteries are over three feet long you know about 10 inches wide about two feet tall you know so if you have eight of them and they're 10 inches wide you know you're looking at a a battery bank that's going to be almost eight feet long and it's going to be sticking out you know, the, the width of the battery is going to be at least, you know, four, you know, three and a half feet wide, you know, plus, you know, three to four feet on every side for working space. 
And so, you know, if your battery is three feet wide and you need, you know, three and a half feet on each each side of it for working space, then, you know, you're looking at, you know, at least a, a 10 foot, if not 11 foot dedicated space just to house the batteries, you know, 11 feet by, you know, eight feet long plus three and a half feet to walk around it. You know, you're looking at at uh, for a, a lead acid battery to to power an entire house. The minimum size of that battery room just for the battery itself is like 11 feet by 11 feet. So you're talking about 120 square foot of real estate in your home needed for your you know battery cabinet. It could shrink down if you use sealed batteries, if you use lithium ion batteries. But that, you know, if you're buying brand new lithium ion batteries right now, that's that's going to get into other kinds of issues such as cost. And of course, the batteries are super heavy. Lead acid batteries are super heavy. Even lithium ion batteries, when you're talking about enough batteries to power a house, uh, become uh, quite heavy. And so I'm not I'm not a big fan of sealed lead acid batteries. What's pictured here are sealed lead acid batteries. And uh, the reason I don't like sealed lead acid is I I think if you're considering lead acid at all, you're a cost driven customer. You know you're going in for something lower than top shelf because of affordability. And sealed batteries cost more than unsealed batteries. And for reasons we get into in the battery class, the, the unsealed batteries, the fact that they can emit that gas also means you can charge them and discharge them a little bit harder. And in, in, in maintenance cycling of batteries, if you can apply a very hard charge to the battery, it can actually clean them and so when you're cleaning your 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 unsealed lead acid batteries you're applying a high voltage to them to, to kind of condition them a little bit better you can't do that with a sealed battery because the gas stays inside the battery and so applying a hard charge to the battery causes it to produce a lot of gas an unsealed battery can take that can take it because the gas leaves the battery to be vented to the outside. A sealed battery has a reduced charging profile because they cannot be aggressively charged. You'll damage the battery if you do. So different, you look at your battery inverter settings for a sealed battery versus an unsealed battery. The unsealed settings, the voltage is going to be kicked up a few ticks compared to the unsealed battery. But anyway, I guess the point of this picture is to show that with the with the unsealed battery, he can be a lot more flexible uh, because you don't need to service all the cells inside it. You know, in in off grid planning, you know, you might not just want one inverter. Uh, it's common to have multiple battery inverters because. If you're living off grid, off your battery and your solar array and your battery inverter fails, you're out of luck. So you don't need the space just for one inverter. You need the space for two inverters. Well, if you have two inverters instead of one inverter, you know, now you need a, a box where you can connect the two inverters together so that you can have one output to your home. So it's not just the space for one inverter anymore. It's the space for two inverters. It's not just the space for two inverters. It's space for two inverters plus the box that connects them together. And then here we have, you know, you know our, our inverters for our batteries. And then, you know, this is not the right term for it, but here we have the inverters for our solar array. And so we it's not just one you know, in, in, in traditional solar design for the last 10 years where we haven't been using batteries, the only space requirement we've had to think about is just one inverter. And that because it's so simple, 
it generally will just tie into the existing electric service panel or tie into like the meter outside the home. Uh, but it, the uh, interconnection doesn't take a lot of uh, complex consideration. But as solar brings batteries back into the fold, all of a sudden you start thinking about things like, oh, well, can the home live off grid? If the home is going off grid, do I need a second inverter for some redundancy? And then, of course, you need to connect them all together. And then you need the, the electronics, not just for the battery, but also for the solar array, whether it's a inverter or a charge controller. <clears throat> and so the, the point of it is, is your batteries take up a lot of space and your electronics take up a lot of space. So we're not talking about putting uh, inverter and batteries inside of the space of a water closet. You, know, you need a lot more space than that. So often uh, solar installers will take uh, the side of a garage and have the whole wall of a garage be where the, the battery inverters and electronics are now going. Because <laughs> that, that, that space could be rather wide, you know, 15 feet or more for, you know, an off-grid residential setup if you want to put them all along the same wall. So let's talk about uh, voltage and amperage. When I say a, a cable is rated for 30 amps, that rating is for the maximum amount of current the conductor can carry every day of the week without fault. Now what's kind of interesting about breakers, <laughs> the 30 amp breaker, you think, well, if it's running at 30 amps, the breaker is not supposed to trip. It's only supposed to trip at higher than 30 amps. So, you know, what's kind of interesting is is uh, a basic breaker, you know, not the ground fault detection breakers, but the most simple breaker on your service panel, that 20 amp breaker, you know, it's rated for a continuous load of 20 amps. And what that means is you could actually, for a, a period of time, pull more than 20 amps through a 20 amp breaker. It'll just take, you know, eventually pulling more amperage through the breaker than what it's rated for will cause the breaker to heat up. And it uses that heat inside the breaker to flick the switch. And so you might have a few minutes or a few seconds, depending on how heavy the load is, to be drawn something much heavier than what it's rated for, and then the safety provisions click in and say, no, that's too much, we'll turn it off. Now there's other ways to sense current through a breaker, such as ground fault detection, uh, that might trigger the breaker sooner than that. Uh, when I got into electrical design, I guess I, I started in the oil industry doing control systems engineering and we were picking out control valves and, you know, you were matching voltage to voltage and amperage to amperage. And you know, I'm a mechanical engineer by degree. I didn't study electrical engineering in college. I, I took a couple of robotics classes, uh, but even then I didn't really have a, a fine grasp on what exactly the difference between voltage and amperage is. You know, voltage is, is potential. You know, and amperage is flow rate or current. So, you know, it, it could be analogous to potential energy where, you know, you have a, a bag of weight at the top of a pulley and it's at high potential energy. You know, if that bag drops on the floor, now it's on the floor, it's down at zero, it's down at the ground, it has no potential energy. So you can think of, of things at higher voltage as having the potential for more power, 
And if they're down at zero voltage, then they have no potential for any power. Maybe a more accurate analogy is to think of voltage as pressure. Now, I use a, a water balloon as an example where you know you connect a water balloon to a hose and the water balloon expands and expands and expands and that plastic you know water balloon it can take the pressure of the water inside it but then you've put in just a little bit more water than what it's rated for and it pops <laughs> uh, impacity is not like that impacity is that electrical flow through the current and if it draws a little bit more current than what it's rated for, it'll heat up and start smoldering, kind of like a, a slow burn, unless the, the current is greatly exceeding the, the current requirement. Whereas voltage is more like, is, is the, the, the skin of the cable, like the skin of the water balloon, <laughs> is it rated for the pressure of that circuit? Because if it's not, It'll just blow up. You know, it won't heat up. It'll blow apart. Voltage is more like pressure. The ampacity is more like flow rate or flow. And so we have, uh, you know, ratings for amperage and ratings for voltage. If you combine the two together, a volt times an amp gives you power. So they, they are related. Um, well, what I think is kind of interesting is, is our, our voltages, we, we think of things that being like 120, 240 as residential electric voltage. But if I go and I take a, a voltmeter and I test the leads on my home, if I live in a rural area, I might actually not be at 240 volts. I might be at 250 volts. You know, rural areas will often operate at a slightly higher voltage. You know, likewise, uh, I might look at the appliance rating of a 240 volt device, and I looked at the nameplate, and it says 230 volts. Like, what the heck? I thought I was on 240 volt, but now I have a 230 volt appliance. You know, what that appliance is saying is, look, you're going to lose some of that voltage between the service panel and the connection on the appliance, and we're telling you our appliance will work at 230 volts. So when I when we talk about 12240 as residential service or like a 480 volt three-phase for a commercial, or we talk about a 600 volt solar array, we're talking about the, the, the nickname kind of the, the voltage class of the product. You know, when I talk about a 48-volt battery, you know, the battery is not always going to be at 48 volts. When it's fully charged, the voltage may be up to 55 volts. Uh, if you're applying a hard charge to an unsealed lead-acid battery, a 48-volt battery bank would get up to 63 volts. And when it's fully discharged, you know, it wouldn't have any voltage in it at all. So, you know, when we're talking about 48 volt batteries or 600 volt inverters or 600 volt solar arrays, you know, we're talking about the the kind of nickname value uh, just for for convention. You know, you're, you're going to say, okay, that's a 48 volt battery bank. You know, you're not going to get into well. It's sometimes it's 55 volts, and at other times it's 44 volts. You know, it's, we're saying that's the, the nameplate rating is 48 volts. Let's see, the definition of a branch circuit are the conductors between the breaker or that final overcurrent protection device and your, your circuits and outlets. Uh, continuous load, loads. So it's a, a load where the maximum current is expected to occur for more for three hours or more. And so that 20, that 20 amp cable is designed to take 20 amps as a continuous load. You know, if, if you have a, a appliance that might start up and it might spike up to 30 amps or 35 amps just for, 
a minute or two and then drop down to 20 amps you know your your cable that's a, a 20 amp cable you know can take the higher amperage for a very short period of time provided that it actually goes away and the continuous load is you know where it, it drops down to And so we get into kind of the, the first step in circuit sizing, uh, which is for AC circuits inside your home, these branch circuits. It says, you know, the, the cable should be sized to take all of your non-continuous loads. And that's just a one-for-one one ratio because those non-continuous loads are turning on and then they're turning off they're not going to give that cable a long enough time to really come up to temperature. And so there's no oversizing that's needed for non-continuous loads, but continuous loads, now that current's always going to be flowing through that conductor and that current is going to generate heat and that heat is going to heat up the cable. You know, continuous loads, just as a, a starting point before anything else, continuous loads, the conductors need to be sized for 25% more ampacity than what that ampacity is for the continuous load. So if I have a, a device that is a 20 amp continuous load, yeah, I need 20 amps, you know, additional 25%. Yeah, I need to get a, 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 a 25 amp cable for that 20 amp continuous load so that my cable doesn't, you know, burn up so that I can take that continuous, uh, the, the heat resulting from that continuous load. And there may be other temperature corrections beyond that. You know, if I'm, if I'm, operating in an elevated temperature, such as an outdoor setting. You know, I might have additional temperature corrections to apply. So, you know, we're not we're not just saying add 25% and you're done. You know, we're saying AC circuits, the, the standard rule of thumb is take the continuous load and add 25% to it. Now, if it's not a continuous load, you do not need to add that additional 25%. Yeah, you know, and so so which loads are considered continuous? Well, you know, solar isn't a load, it's a supply. But, you know, if you're asked a question, you know, is a solar array considered for the purposes of design a continuous load or a non-continuous load? You know, what you would say is, well, I think the solar array is supposed to be on for more than three hours at a time. You know, the sun comes up at nine and it sets at five, you know, so that, that inverter should be operating for more than three hours straight. So we need to treat solar like it's a continuous load. You know, maybe that, that window unit is not designed, you know, that we can assume that a window unit could be on for more than three hours. You know, that refrigerator is going to be on for more than three hours. The dishwasher is not going to be on for three hours. And so out of all these loads, you know, I would say the dishwasher is the non-continuous load, but the fridge, the air conditioner unit, the solar array are continuous loads. And so right off the bat, we start getting just, just general sizing principles. And, and then we start, as we get further into through our code discussion, we start to get into special use cases. So it says, oh, well, what about for motor circuits? Uh, it says, well, there's a special provision for motor circuits that's coming later. So we're going to punt that to, to later until we get into a more specialized uh, discussion. Uh, voltage drop. That's kind of an interesting one. Um, most solar arrays are designed for 
you know, a 2% voltage drop because after all, you know, solar is supposed to generate electricity and, and generally speaking, um, it is going to be cost effective to keep upsizing your wire to reduce resistance. Um, but there is a point where upsizing your wire even further than that gets into diminishing returns. So, you know, when solar is designed around a, a one and a half to two percent voltage drop, they're thinking about economics, not what is the bare minimum level of acceptability for voltage drop. Um, which is is defined as as you don't want more than a three percent voltage drop from that breaker uh, to the load, uh, with a little bit more of an exception given for branch circuits that have multiple outlets that could say have up to a five percent maximum voltage drop. And so what they're looking at is saying, okay, well, we don't want your voltage drop on that circuit to drop to the point where your appliance no longer turns on. You know, furthermore, a volt times an amp is a watt. You know, if you have an appliance that's supposed to operate at 240 volts, but instead it's operating at 230 volts and it's using the same amount of power, it'll actually draw a little bit more amperage. And so you can get into electrical issues when you have a voltage drop that exceeds three to 5% and that your appliances may not turn on, <laughs> sorry, and that your appliances may not turn on, or if they do, they may be drawing more amperage than what they're rated for. And so hopefully, that cable has that ampacity to spare, but if it doesn't, you know, you'll either flick your breaker, and if your electrician solves that tripping breaker issue by upsizing the breaker so it doesn't trip anymore, then the conductor could be heating up to the point where it burns your house down. So, you know, electricians look at voltage drop, and they say no more than, than 3% voltage drop, so that we don't have to worry about the amperage creeping up and uh, getting outside the parameters of our oversizing. And you have to remember that that 25% that, that we've added is not just spare capacity in case you use it in the future. You know, they're just saying right off the bat on a continuous load, it's going to have higher temperatures than non-continuous loads. And so that 25% is there just for the temperature elevation caused by the electricity in the cable for the continuous load. It's not like it's reserve capacity where you can just use more load than what the cable's rated for because you oversized it and gave yourself a little bit more headroom. You know, that headroom is there for a dedicated reason. And if there's a separate reason to put more current onto that, that cable, you need to separately add additional headroom for that. So as we get in further into the discussion, we'll find other reasons to derate the ampacity of a conductor, such as if you have a bunch of cables bundled, to get, bundled together, in a confined space, such as inside of a conduit, you know, the, the heat from multiple cables can impact the, their neighbors. And so when you're bundling a bunch of cable together in conduit, there are additional temperature derate factors to consider. When you are going up on a rooftop versus inside a building, there are additional temperature derate factors to consider. You know, also this 5% this voltage drop um, also kind of implies that the lower the voltage you get, <laughs> the, the less distance you can go before that voltage becomes unusable. And so that's why, you know, on, on a, you know, a lot of off-gridders, you know, they might run lighting circuits on 12-volt circuits, but they're just powering a small cabin. You know, whereas you get into something the size of a recreational vehicle or motorhome or RV, 
So you're, you're Walter White and Jesse Pinkman driving a Winnebago all over Arizona. The battery bank in that Winnebago will be 24 volts because they want to get that, that power all the way from the front of the Winnebago where the engine and battery are all the way to the back of the Winnebago where the, you know, DC refrigerator is. Uh, but then again, <laughs> by the time you get into, uh, you know, DC circuits inside of homes, you know, even uh, a 24 volt DC circuit may be uh, too uh, little power to travel over long distances. So you know, on 24 volt DC circuits, you get into uh, power line injectors that will put more power into the circuit to make up for the voltage drop along the way. You know, or you get into higher higher voltage capacities to travel longer distances. Now, all the way up to high voltage power lines where they they you know get into tens of thousands of kilovolts to pass electricity, you know, all the way across the state. So getting into some more definitions, feeders, all circuit conductors between service equipment, the source of a separately derived system, or other power supply sources, and the final branch circuit of the overcurrent device. So power supply circuits are feeder circuits. You know, the grid coming into the home is a feeder circuit. Your solar array going into the service panel is a feeder circuit. You know, all the way up to the service panel is a feeder circuit until you get to that final branch circuit. And so what are the, the feeder circuits on this one line diagram? Uh, we got the, the solar array here is a feeder circuit. You know, the utility here is a feeder circuit. And then all these loads coming off of it are branch circuits. We'll come back to this. Now, feeder circuits are sized to be based on, nothing new here, 125% of the continuous load plus the non-continuous load. Now, feeder circuits are protected against overcurrent by an overcurrent protection device. So this, this is your main service panel, and here is a, a feeder circuit that's designed for um, 200 amps. And what happens when, when all, you know, you count up all the, the breakers on a service panel, you might get confused. You might go and count 300 amps worth of breakers on a service panel and then say, okay, well, what's up with this? I only have a 200 amp breaker. If I turn all the loads on in my house at the same time, can I flip that 200 amp breaker? The answer is yes. If you put 300 amps of load on a 200 amp breaker, it'll flip the 200 amp breaker. So why do we allow our homes to have 300 amps worth of circuits on a 200 amp supply? Well, because we're assuming that not all those loads are going to be on at the exact same time. Uh, but that's why, you know, in winter time, if everybody goes out to Walmart and buys, you know, electric heaters and plugs them into their wall, all of a sudden the main breaker on your service panel might flip, you know, depending on if you have multiple branch circuits that are all being maxed out by these heaters going on at the same time. Let's talk about the ground. You know, grounding is the drain 
of the system. You know, you, we talk about high voltage, but just like that, that bird that can walk across the power line at high voltage, if there's nowhere for that voltage to go, it's just sitting up there at high voltage. You know, if you're, if you have a, 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 a sandbag at the top of a pulley suspended in the air by 15 feet, you know, yeah, there's a lot of potential energy up there at that elevated weight, but it's not doing anything until someone cuts the cord and it comes crashing down to ground. So, you know, voltage has to move from high voltage to low voltage to, to get anything done. And so you do need to ground your electric service panel to give it a zero voltage reference so that your 120 volt circuit can flow electricity from a higher voltage potential, you know, all the way to ground. And so we have to extend that, that low zero voltage all the way out or to at least give it some sort of return so that we can deliver not only the high voltage power to the appliance, but also give it a low voltage return. And so when you look at a power plug and it has, a, a, has two prongs, you know, the electricity is coming in one way and it's going out the other way and you stick your voltmeter into the outlet, and you're going to read a 120-volt difference between the hot leg and the, the neutral conductor or the home run leg that goes home. And then on top of that, there's a, a secondary ground most of the time. Sometimes you still get into two-prong outlets, but when you have that third prong, <coughs> That's generally an additional grounding reference. And so we got, we actually have a, a couple of grounds going on in a standard plug. We have the, the actual ground, which is like a, a zero voltage reference point. And, you know, you want anything metal that is electrical. <laughs> to be attached to that zero voltage reference point because if a loose wire contacts the side of a of a box if it's at that zero voltage reference point and it hits that side of the box it's going to spark it could cause a fire you say well well then 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 why ground our electrical boxes well if you don't then that voltage that doesn't spark but it's still touching the size of the metal that's bringing that metal box up to a high point of voltage. And then you go and touch it, all of a sudden you're the path to ground. You're the low voltage potential. So, you know, we want to ground our, our metal boxes, our metal components, because we don't want a leak in the system to, you know, to, to stay, <laughs> to, to leak into the metal and not drain. <laughs> It's more dangerous if it stays in that metal and we come by and touch it and electrocute ourselves than if that electricity is draining the ground, which, can, you know, it's a problem. I'm not saying it's not, but, you know, we ground our metal parts to, you know, mitigate that problem when it does occur. And so we have a ground path for problems that when electricity goes wrong and it hits that metal, it, it drains the ground. But we have a separate ground that forms that high voltage to low voltage reference point called the neutral conductor. And that takes the electricity from its high voltage coming into the appliance to its low voltage going out of the appliance. And so it gets really confusing because now we have a couple of things that are grounded. We have a, a grounded conductor. We have equipment ground. There are two different things. We also have a, a term called the grounding electrode conductor. So, so what are all these things? Well, basically, the, the grounding electrode conductor called a GEC is the final home run ground 
between your system and the actual ground. So down here, there's a, a ground rod or a ground plate or a water pipe that's exposed to ground that's being used as the, the grounding electrode, you know, that, that piece of metal that is sunk into the ground and is using the zero voltage potential of your surrounding dirt to bring the service panel down to zero voltage potential and serving as a drain. So the grounding, this is the grounding electrode and the very last wire connecting the whole grounding system of the building to that grounding electrode has a special term called the grounding electrode conductor. And I think the best way to think of the grounding electrode conductor is it's like the, the, the four inch large drain pipe that connects your home drain to the sewer. You know, your, your sinks and your bathtubs only have drains that are, you know, an inch or two large. The connection of your whole house drain to the sewer is three to four inches large. It's much larger. It has to be sized not just to drain one appliance, but to drain the whole house to the sewer. Similarly, the, the grounding electrode conductor, that final wire between the house ground and the dirt, has to be large enough to drain your whole house to ground. The little pathways to ground each little metal bit to ground don't have to be sized the same as your whole house ground. So you're, there's the... There's the equipment ground conductor. Uh, it's, a, it's the ground that connects all your metal pieces and then gets connected up to your ground bar. You know, there's your equipment ground conductors that's grounding the metal outlet box and keeping it at its low potential. And if the electricity in that outlet box uh, should go wrong, it hits the side of that metal outlet box and that current travels down the metal uh, equipment ground and goes into ground, and yeah, that can cause breakers to trip and ground fault detections to trigger, uh, but that's that's how it's supposed to work. So we got the grounding electrode, the grounding electrode conductor, and then the smaller equipment ground conductors that, that route to it. So the grounding electrode conductor is the object that, that literally establishes that direct connection to earth. Generally, it's a ground rod that's driven into the side, uh, the, the earth along the side of your building. Um, then there's the grounding electrode conductor, which connects to that ground rod. Uh, I guess we're kind of... <laughs> Move into the next point here. Service conductors are the conductors from the point of service to the service disconnect. So they are power supply conductors. So it's like right into to National Electric Code, we're getting into, uh, you know, we already defined <laughs> feeder circuits. And then right after we define feeder circuits, we define you know, service entrance services, and service entrance conductors. So what's the difference? Well, feeder circuits are more generic. And so feeder circuits, because they're more generic, they're defined earlier in National Electric Code because National Electric Code tries to define the more generic stuff up front and the more specific stuff as you move along. So even though service entrance conductors, utility services, are commonplace, and so you find them at the front of National Electric Code, there's still an order to it where the, the service entrance conductors are a type of feeder. You know, it's like, uh, you know, all squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares. You know, service entrance conductors are feeder conductors, 
but not all feeder conductors are service entrance conductors. So right here, we have our utility meter going into our main service panel, and our main service panel is being supplied by our service entrance conductors. But separately, I might have another panel, a sub panel, pulled off of my main panel. And so the, the wire run between my panel and my sub panel, it kind of does the same thing as the wire run between my, you know, between my meter and my panel. This, you know, the service is being supplied to this main breaker, and then this feeder conductor is supplying the, the, the sub panel. You know, this is this is a feeder conductor. That's a feeder conductor. Only that is a service entrance conductor. And why does that matter? Well, there might be some special rules that only apply to service entrance conductors that don't apply to feeder conductors. And that's that's you know, it might not be rules that add more constraints to sizing. It might actually be rules that subtract constraints from sizing. You know, might, they might say, okay, well, utilities, you know, don't need to oversize their conductors for, for their feeders. You know, it's protected by a 200 amp service. There's 300 amps of load. So, you know, they might give them special, you know, exemptions. And so looking at this line diagram, you should now be able to identify where the ground is, where the grounding electrode is, where the equipment ground conductors is, are, and where is the, the service conductor and the point of service. The service point is the connection between the facilities of the service utility and the premise wiring. And so like our, our, our utility point of service in this case is that utility meter where the utility comes and owns all the side up to that top of the meter and then you own from the bottom of the meter back to your electric service panel. And so sometimes with solar, you, instead of landing on you know, the service panel itself, you'll bring the system and come into those service entrance conductors, but you're still on your side of the meter. You're just between the main meter and the main brake. Um, yeah, feeders shall not be derived from auto transformers unless the system supplied has a grounded conductor that is electrically connected to the auto transformer grounded conductor all right uh, welcome back hold on okay so what i really want to do is this is the first instance where they mention a grounded conductor so i don't really want to get into what a what a auto transformer is although they they are used in solar uh sometimes the the most notable example is the when you have a 120 volt battery inverter trying to supply a 240 volt uh, system, you would put a transformer between the two uh, to basically rearrange the electricity to turn, step up that voltage, turn it into a, a split phase system. So they're just saying that, you know, when you have a, a the a system that is supplying the system through the transformer, then the neutral needs to be connected to the system. What I really want to explain is this this uh, this neutral connection. And so here's a, a line diagram of the electric grid, a generator. A battery inverter that is is a uh, hun uh, a, a battery inverter and a solar inverter and this uh, 
So, so what we see here is is power coming in from the grid, and then we have a, a generator that is on a transfer switch. So the grid can can switch between the generator and the transfer switch, and all these devices share a neutral line. And then I guess we're just going to kind of move on. This neutral line then gets connected to ground. So I don't want to, this is kind of a special case. I want to keep going for a minute. Um, you know, here we're talking about nickname nominal voltages again. So we're just going to keep going. Um, here we're hanging a transformer on the side of some power lines and here's our solar array we're interconnecting to the grid now these power lines you, know, you and I would consider them to be high voltage the electric utility would consider them to be a, a low voltage distribution circuit you know just 2,000 volts of electricity now, whereas our homes are using 240 volts of electricity divided between two feeder legs. 120 volts a piece, and with reference to ground, you reference one to ground and you get 120 volts. If you reference two to ground, you can get 240 volts. And so our this is a, a a wiring diagram that reflects the coils of copper that are actually inside of that inverter that are wound in a way to take that 200, 2,400 kilovolt connection and step it down to a, a, a 220 leg volt supplies. It's by winding the, the, the inverter windings. Winding the the copper coils will get manipulate the voltage. So looking at some some parts on this kind of uh, connection to the utility grid, we got a high voltage line. And we have a neutral this utility transformer and these fuses. When you're when you're connecting the transformers or cutting power to the house at the utility side, you know, they can do it by coming and pulling the meter or they have really long poles that they come and press the, the fuses up and out of the circuit to turn off power to the transformer itself. Now here we have a, a ground wire going to a ground rod down at the side of the pole. You know, here we have uh, the, the weather head where our uh, power lines are coming into the home. You know, this is kind of interesting. I uh, Getting into solar, you know, I look at something that looks like this, and I think, you know, what a mess. These wires are just kind of hanging out there, and there's a lot of slack in them. You know, why is that? Well, it's so that, you know, water is going to fall on these cables, and it's going to travel down these power lines, and, and you know, you don't want that water shooting down the power lines and into this conduit and dripping down onto the live terminals inside the meter base. So they're arranging the water so that when it comes down this cable, it's going to uh, drain. It's going to drip off the cables rather than go into the weather head. Or they make a, a drip loop with their wires. So in solar, you have to be aware of that when you're you know, have these power lines going into the rooftop, you want to enter in from the bottom of the box rather than the top of the box or the side of the box. You want to go into the bottom, just like we're going into the bottom on this weather head so that the water drips out of it. it goes down in the meter base, the meter box. So the neutral conductor 
The conductor connected to the neutral point of a system that is intended to carry current under normal circumstances. And what does this mean? The neutral is connected to ground at one place in the system. The neutral is connected to ground. It can occur inside the electric service panel. It is common to have it occur inside the actual meter base or meter box. You know, but here we see, see a, a neutral to ground connection. Here we see a neutral to ground connection. Here we see a neutral to ground connection. And by grounding the neutral, by grounding what is considered to be a, a you know, a, a current carrying conductor, we take that neutral and we bring its potential all the way down to zero volts. And that causes, you know, your hot leg of power to travel through a load and that electricity has somewhere to go because it can go from its high potential down to its load potential. But that doesn't mean that the neutral, you know, being at a zero voltage reference doesn't carry any current you know it can have voltage in it as that voltage is draining the ground you know so so the neutral is the drain you know so if you have a, a power outlet and you have a neutral line going in and you have a ground line going in and you check the voltage difference between the neutral line and the ground line it should be zero volts you check the voltage between the ground and the hot leg and the neutral in the hot leg you should get 120 volts either way but when the current goes through the appliance and through that power outlet it's not supposed to be traveling through that green ground. It's supposed to be traveling through that neutral back to that one point of interconnection in the panel or in the meter base where that neutral is connected to ground, where that drain is. So in our electrical drain, there's not just the grounding electrode and the grounding electrode conductor. There's also that one bond between neutral and ground That'll also come up in a, a few minutes. So these are just different electrical services. Um, it is it is very common, you know, in in the United States, we mostly have 120, 240 volt split phase circuits. That's where we have two 120 volt legs. And they position them to be equal and opposite of each other in kind of uh, something that's unique to AC um, sinusoidal waves, uh, such that by being equal and opposite to each other, you can get a 240 volt difference between the individual 120 volt legs. You know, here we have a 240 volt service that is just one 240 volt line plus a neutral and ground. That would be very similar to a 120 volt branch circuit. It's just a 240 volt branch circuit. So I recently did a site evaluation on a hotel and their air conditioner units plug into the wall, but they weren't 120 volt devices. They were actually 240 volt devices coming off a 240 volt leg. You know, so it, it looks very similar to this 120 volt leg. There's no difference except this leg is powered with 120 volts. This leg's powered with 240 volts. So how does that happen? Well, maybe back at the main service panel, instead of being 120 volt legs, it's something more robust than that. You know, they, they might have a higher power service. You know, what's, what's common for uh, commercial is to have a, a winding, and this is, this is called a delta connection, and this is called a, a Y connection. And they're different, and they require two different inverters. If you have a delta electric service, you need a delta commercial inverter. 
If you have a Y configuration electric service, you need a Y configuration inverter. And so in, but, but in, in either case, you have a, a phase A, phase B, and phase C electric service. And, you know, from, from phase A, from one phase to neutral, you get 120 volt potential. And then, uh, you know, depending on what phase it is, uh, depending on if your, your circuit is being powered by, you know, two legs of the three phase service or one leg of the three phase service or all three legs of the same three phase service, you can get uh, 240 volts out of a delta service, 208 volts out of a delta service, just 208 out of a Y service. So depending on what uh, specific electronics are inside that building, um, you might pick one electric service over the other or vice versa. You know, if the utility is supplying you with a Y three-phase commercial service, uh, you may not be able to to buy devices that require a, a Delta service without a transformer going in between the two. So as an engineer, I am very well trained going back to, you know, college homework exercises that would just give you nightmares years after college it's numbers and numbers and numbers and numbers and we're drilled into the concept of significant figures how far out how many decimal points out do you need to carry your calculation so that you know you are exact versus how many decimals do you carry out where the the numbers become meaningless because your numbers weren't that precise to begin with. So if your numbers are measured in inches, uh, dividing numbers to get millimeters may not matter because your level of precision was an inch wide, not a millimeter wide. So this is something that engineers obsess over. Does that same level of obsession apply to National Electric Code? how precise you need to be with your calculations. This says, you know, when we're talking about amperage, we don't need to talk about amperage with decimal points. You just round down to the nearest amp. Okay, that's easy enough. So when you're making out nameplates, where you have to list the operating amperage or the operating voltage and you're running your electrical calculations with your significant figures and you say, oh, that's going to be precisely 12 and a half amps you know, on the sticker, on the placard, you know, on your wire size, you'd be looking for a 12 amp cable. And why is that? Remember, Electric code is not trying to be a precise engineering calculation. It's trying to give you uh, some kind of like fudge factor that's not too much, but not too little. And so they're saying, because we've been kind of fudging the numbers up to this point, once you get to a decimal, just round down and drop the decimal. Likewise, you'll get into exceptions in National Electric Code that'll say things like, you might not need to size it for this amperage if you have a precise engineering calculation done where someone is stamping it. That might be how to get around abiding by this temperature D rate figure. You know, again, that's because they're not trying to give you a chart to cover every single possible calculation you can make. They've, they've made the, the decision-making process a little bit less precise to uh, develop these charts so that we can just say, okay, it's a 20-amp circuit. I need this large a cable because it's rated for 20 amps. So we got uh, branch circuit calculations uh, for certain loads. Um, 
You know, like uh, how many watts do we need to account for for multiple outlet assemblies for, uh, you know, for all these little 15 amp outlets? How do we stack them up onto an electric service panel? You know, how do we calculate the the load for a, a dryer or stovetop, motor loads, light bulbs? They might all have 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 little nuances that that get along with saying, well, maybe not all the light bulbs in your house are going to be on at the same time. Well, how might that apply to dryers or stovetops? <laughs> well, generally speaking, they're going to say, well, if you have one stovetop in your building, you know, we're going to assume that's going to be on at its full rated capacity. So, Generally, a lot of the, the discounts on do you count every single refrigerator, every single dryer, every single washing machine in your load calculation, that is only something you get into with commercial buildings like a hotel that might have dozens of air conditioner units and they are given allowances so that they don't have to size their electrical service as if every single air conditioner unit were on at the exact same time. You know, there are rules and guidelines for calculating the size of your circuits and the size of your electric service panel uh, for new construction. Not nude construction, new construction. You can get in trouble if you confuse the two. Uh, loads for additions to existing installations. So, you know, basically what we're talking about here is, is there's this section of National Electric Code will get into calculating uh, load estimating. And the reason for that is that the minimum size of a feeder or a service is the sum of all of the loads on that service after any demand factors are taken into consideration. And generally those demand factors give you the ability to discount those loads if you're installing multiple devices, which are generally going to be more beneficial to commercial buildings than residential buildings. Now, what that also means is, you know, when you apply those factors, if then you go and actually turn them all on at the same time, you can get into brownouts. Now, here's a, a good definition. The authority having jurisdiction, or the AHJ, an organization, office, or individual responsible for enforcing the requirements of a code or standard or for approving equipment, materials, an installation, or procedure. So who is your authority having jurisdiction? Well, for one, remember that the authority having jurisdiction, they're the ones who get to decide whether or not you're following National Electric Code or something uh, you know, more strict than National Electric Code. So you know, for, uh, a good example would be uh, apartment complex wiring in New York City. So when your buildings are 100 stories tall, the safety concerns get elevated as opposed to a building that's only two stories tall. And so in New York City, you know, instead of allowing an electrician to put Romex down the side of the wall, uh, it's common for them to say, no, we want you to have that power to be in conduit. And for supply cables, which might need some mechanical protection, like to be in metal conduit, the authority having jurisdiction may say, you know what, <laughs> code says DC wiring has to be in metal conduit for protection, uh, but it doesn't say whether that could be metal clad conduit or EMT conduit, and often in densely populated buildings that are multiple stories tall, if there's a requirement for physical protection, they'll want you to use even more robust metal conduit like rigid conduit or intermediary metal conduit, which we'll get to. 
So for 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 our purpose, how do you determine who your AHJ is? Well, there's a, a great website you can go to uh, called DesireUSA.org, and it's kind of a, a database of renewable energy policies and incentives. And one of those policies is the, the interconnection standards for your particular state. So if you're confused about who you need to, to run your project through for permission to interconnect to the grid, I mean, generally speaking, you're calling up your power company and getting their interconnection application. And then you might also have to call up your city and pull a local building permit or local electrical permit. So you might have a, a city inspection and you might have a utility inspection. Um, but, but generally for the, the rules of what's the largest system you can interconnect um, or even what's the best starting point for figuring out who you get this interconnection application from, go into the, the Desire website is a, a good starting point to get your, your different guidelines. And they'll give you contact information to uh, get a little more info. So here we're getting into feeder and service load calculations. So uh, there's different load correction factors for uh, heavy duty appliances, you know, uh, space heating. Um, So then we get to calculating the, the neutral. It says the, the maximum unbalanced load is the maximum net load between the neutral conductor and any one ungrounded conductor. And so the neutral conductor has that connection to ground. And so there the neutral conductor is a current carrying conductor. It carries the current from the device back home to the service panel, you know, it's forming that drain that gets down to the, the main drain at the service panel. But the neutral conductor is a grounded conductor, whereas the, the supply conductors, you know, often they're called the hot conductors, the hot conductors are ungrounded conductors. And there's different nuances on when you're permitted to undersize your neutral or not. You know, on renewable energy systems, the plane it's safe is do not undersize your neutral. And so on, on a dwelling unit, to calculate what's the size of a electric service panel you need, um, you can say, okay, well, starting out, you need 10 kilowatts of general power plus... Uh, three watts of lighting per square foot at a discount factor of 40%, you know, one and a half kilowatts of power for each 20 amp branch circuit. And then you, you take your kind of non-continuous loads, your, you know, your water heater that only turns on for a few minutes and then turns back off again. You know, a dryer that is certainly a heavy load, but your dryer cycle is only for 55 minutes. You know, our continuous loads are for three hours or more. Your dryer is not a continuous load. And so it's giving you some, some fudge factors and then also telling you, you know, what appliances you don't have to, to you know, mark up by another 25% when calculating your loads. Heating and air conditioning loads, they're saying, okay, well, you're going to give have a different case use for the summertime versus the wintertime versus the spring and fall. You know, in summer you're using air conditioning, winter you're using heat, and the spring or fall you might use heat in the morning and air conditioning uh, in the midday. And so you look at different case uses and pick the maximum of them, which is generally wintertime heat or summertime air conditioning. You know, in, in apartment complexes, you know, what I kind of think is interesting is how much, how deep can the discounting go? You know, if, if a home needs to be a, a 200 amp service panel, 
and an apartment complex has, you know, a hundred units, you know, does that mean we need a, a 20 megawatt electric service for the apartment complex? Now the answer is no. You know, the, the apartment complex for the, the supply feeding the, the co total complex uh, can be discounted to say, well, if one home needs a hundred percent of its rating, whatever that may come out to, then if you have 60 units or more, 62 units or more of that exact same household, just like in your electric service panel, we're assuming that not all the circuits are coming on at the same time in the apartment complex, we're assuming that not all the houses are using their power at the same time, and they can discount that, that load for the supply to all those houses by as much as 80% for each unit. And that discount factor is substantially less the smaller and smaller the apartments get to until you get down to a single unit where there's no discount factor or broad-based discount factor for the whole power supply. You know, schools might get a different consideration because of the safety considerations of lots of little kids. Um, restaurants have different energy profiles than other buildings. You know, a big lunch rush and a big evening rush, but they're not full-time use buildings. So where this comes into play is how large of an electric service you need to power a building. Now, what if the building already exists? If the building already exists, you can monitor the electrical demand of the building and use that information rather than all these predefined calculations to determine your load. And that's you know, a more accurate way to do it because, you know, just look at LED lighting. You know, the adoption of LED lighting is tanking the power requirements of lighting factors. It might take NEC a few years to update that. And so if you're just using the rules of thumb for determining your building load in NEC, you will often be overestimating your power supply. What's the definition of a building? A building is a, a standalone structure that's cut off from adjoining structures by firewalls. You know, a garage is considered a building. Now, why is that important? Well, there's there's different physical protection requirements of conduits for those that are on buildings versus not attached to buildings. So you know, if you are doing solar that is inside a building and needs to be in metal conduit, if you have a, a ground mount, that's not, the wire's not going to be inside a building. You know, plastic conduit can be, can be acceptable. Bonding is, is, you know, Almost the same thing as grounding. You know, bonding is establishing continuity between two points. Grounding is establishing continuity to ground. Uh, so the bonding jumper system is that connection between the grounded circuit conductor and the supply side bonding jumper or equipment ground conductor or both. What does that mean? The bonding jumper system is how uh, the the neutral is connected to ground. Or how the ground system is connected together for that matter. And so so here is a, a solar rail and it's metal. And at this point on this project, 
we've run out of rail and we've had to splice another rail onto it. And so we have a piece of metal and then another piece of metal in between them that is a structurally substantial piece of metal. It's strong enough to shore up this gap between the two pieces of rail. And then we have a metal screw going through that piece of metal, touching the other piece of metal. So you might think metal to metal to metal, you know, that's a grounded connection. Except, you know, solar rail is anodized to prevent corrosion. And anodization increases resistance. And so even though you might have a metal piece touching a metal piece, that anodized coating can prohibit electricity from flowing. But all of your metal racking on your solar array has to be grounded. So, you know, you can do that in two ways. You can run ground wire throughout every piece of metal up on the roof and have grounding, grounding lugs touching every piece of metal on the roof along with that ground wire. Or here is a, a listed component that ensures that this piece of rail and that piece of rail get grounded. And, you know, maybe that, that splice is a listed grounding component. Usually it's not. Usually it's, it's different. And so, you know, just because you're screwing some metal into some other metal does not mean you're officially, in the eyes of code, forming, bonding the two pieces together. You know, what, what code is going to try and do is, is make sure that whatever is being considered the ground path will actually be the ground path. Now we're just going to skip over this slide and keep on, keep on rolling. I think this one's on the quiz, the definition of a substation. Subs that's what you call these things on the side of the road, your utility substations, uh, which are an enclosed assembly of equipment under control of qualified persons, you know, behind a fence through which electricity is passed for the purposes of switching or modifying its characteristics. Uh, branch circuits. Branch circuits are on or between buildings or poles or equipment. Um, there's a table that that kind of lists all different kinds of equipment that might potentially have uh, special use cases or special rules and regulations. You know, communication circuits that are low voltage as opposed to high voltage. You know, fire alarms that might uh, be allowed to be interconnected at a point ahead of everything else so that if the building loses power, the fire alarms don't. So there might be allowances for different interconnection rules for fire alarm circuits versus other circuits. De-icing and snow melt equipment would be high amperage but limited use. Uh, floating buildings, have, like boat docks, have their own uh, code issues. So table 225.3 is kind of like the, the real table of contents for finding, quickly identifying what um, equipment might have special rules and then flipping to that section Now, definition of a raceway. A raceway is an exposed channel for metal or non-metal materials expressly designed for holding wires or cables or bus bars with additional functions permitted by this code. So conduit is a kind of raceway. A cable tray is a kind of raceway. Um, you know, even a wire bracket that just kind of hangs off a line uh, could be considered a raceway. And now we have another definition, enclosed. 
surrounded by a case, housing, fence, or wall that prevents people from accidentally contacting energized parts. So there could be a requirement for an enclosed raceway and like a, a conduit, you know, a circular tube with fittings on the end all the way from point A to point B would be an enclosed raceway. Ground fault, an unintentional uh, connection to ground between an ungrounded conductor, you know, one of the supply conductors of the circuit, and a normally non-current carrying conductor or piece of metal or metal raceway or the earth, the ground fault. So when you have a fault between something that's de-energized and something that's de-energized, that's a ground fault. Then we have a ground fault circuit interrupter, a device for de-energizing a circuit within a period of time when the current to ground exceeds a certain value. So we have to remember that that when, uh, let's say you take a 15 amp branch circuit and you plug in a 20 amp electric heater. You turn it on and you run it for a few minutes and the breaker is going to pop on your service panel. That's not a ground fault. You know, that's a, a breaker flipping because of overcurrent. You know, it's saying, hey, if you run that heater for very much longer, that circuit's going to start heating up. And because it's rated for 15 amps instead of 20, it can cause a fire. So I'm going to flip and turn off. That's not the same thing as... Uh, to kind of borrow from Bill Murray and Groundhog's Day, going and plugging a, a toaster into the bathtub and dropping it in, and all of a sudden you have all this high current flowing, you know, into your water pipes and water drains and out the ground. You know, that's that's a ground fault. And so, uh, and, and another kind of fault would be an arc fault. So an arc fault is caused from loose connections. So let's say you have a, a connector that's connecting two cables, but that connector wasn't made up right. And so the two cables are really close to each other, or they might even be touching each other, but that touch is loose. You know, so let's say you have a cable termination that needs to be bolted down, but the installer didn't tighten the bolt tight enough. Now, maybe they didn't install the bolt tight enough because they weren't strong enough to do it, or they weren't checking it with a torque wrench, or they didn't have a torque wrench and they didn't want to put all their hand strength into it and break the bolt and over tighten it, which can be its own issues. But for whatever reason, that electrical connection is not made up tight. And so the electricity is not faulting to ground, but it, it's jumping almost like static electricity from one side to the other side, and there's a small air gap in the middle of it. That's an arc fault, and that can have its own problems. Uh, in, in many ways, an arc fault can be the most dangerous of all because, you know, it's not going to flip a breaker. It's not going to uh, open up the breaker. It's not going to trigger a ground fault. Uh, arc faults can cause fires as much as anything else. An arc fault could be occurring at an amperage that is less than the breaker requirement. So the breaker, a standard breaker, does not necessarily trip during an arc fault. You know, the solar industry now has been required to put arc fault detection uh, capabilities into their inverters. So back in the day, you fire up a system and it works perfectly, and everyone goes home and is happy. And the same system, you fire it up with an arc fault detecting inverter. The inverter could say, you know, one of those connections out at the array isn't made up correctly, and it's a little loose, and it's causing a little bit of arc faulting in the connector, so you need to go fix that before I turn on. And so we might have heard about... Uh, Tesla fires in the news, you know, uh, putting Tesla on top of like Walmarts and now Walmart, I think they've since settled, but was 
threatening to sue Tesla to get out of their solar leases because of some fires that have occurred uh, on the on the property, and it could easily be from um, you know connectors getting down into a puddle of water, and that puddle of water is on the top of a plastic roof, so it's not like that puddle of water is is being electrified and then draining the ground and then maybe the puddle of water evaporates and the connector is just sitting there but the the terminals on that connector are corroded so the electricity is kind of jumping around the the corrosion now that can cause a fire it can cause the 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 um, connector to melt and start burning up the roof and so uh you know, the inverters installed up to, uh, I think, like 2014 or so did not have arc fault detection into them, and Solar City was installing arrays before then. So, kind of older generation solar installs um, did not have the safe, do not always have the same safety protection circuits as, as newer inverters. On addition, additionally, <laughs> some of the, your your legacy inverters had blind spots in the ground fault detection system too. So, um, well, I don't think we're quite ready to explain that that quite yet. Uh, but the 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 kind of learning point right now is that uh, now we have fuse blocks or fuse boxes on both the positive side and the negative side. Uh, to, to make our inverters be in a floating uh, architecture the way it used to be and the way it still is on some uh, battery inverters is this negative side here would get connected to ground and you'd only fuse the positive sides and that could cause a, a ground fault where one circuit for whatever reason starts faulting to ground and other circuits join in, um, and and then that that starts raising the voltage of ground, and so the inverter uh, looking at the ground voltage versus the voltage of the system doesn't doesn't see the fault. You know they've they've changed that by removing the negative to ground connection and isolating the ground fault detection circuit from ground so it, it sees them better, a little more cost put into it. And so there's different ways to reduce ground fault versus arc faults. Um, you know, a, a ground fault would occur when you are going, pulling your cable around a very steep curve you know, like a steep fitting, like a 90 degree elbow. And to make that hard to bend cable turn 90 degrees, you're you're shoving it into the fittings and you're eating into your cable jacket and you nick your cable jacket. So now you have some exposed copper. You know, that exposed copper then hits the side of the box and it causes a ground fault. Uh, the a common way that that happens, again, going back to these these solar city fires, is that uh, they may be bolting the the conduit that runs across the roof. They may be bolting the conduit supports down onto the roof, and then they may be tightening the conduit onto the conduit support so that it's it's hard attachment rather than a loose attachment where the conduit can kind of wiggle on top of the conduit support. That hard attachment as thermal expansion applies to a hot roof and to metal on the hot roof that you can make up your, your conduit completely well made and tight. And if that conduit run is long enough on a hot roof, it can pull out of the fittings down the road. And so I, I really dislike EMT conduit runs on the rooftop. It would be much better to have a, a cable tray where the cables are kind of loosely laid into the, the cable tray, uh, whereas conduit 
uh, the conduit can pull out of these fittings and then all of a sudden you have a, a sharp edge inside the fitting from your conduit that can bite into your cable. So that's caused some fires. So, you know, shorter circuit links to avoid uh, long conduit runs so that you don't have quite as bad thermal expansion, uh, avoiding sharp turns. Uh, you know, those are ways to reduce the potential for ground faults. Uh, and then arc faults is more of a matter of workmanship, you know, making sure that your connections are made to the torque requirements that are specified in the installation manuals. Okay, so outside branch circuits and feeders. The installation of outside wiring on the surface of buildings is permitted for circuits not over 600 volts. So, you know, the solar can go up to 1,000 or 1,500 volt circuits. They can even go up to 1,000 or 1,500 volt circuits on a residential setting, but it can't be on a building. It can't be on a garage. So a, a dedicated ground mount, residential or non-residential, can be at higher than 600 volts, although there are additional safety requirements for higher voltage systems, such as putting a fence around it, securing access to it. Um, And it's it's specifying you know what is what is allowed as your raceways and cable traits for that uh, exterior branch circuit, and it's saying there's a bunch of different ways to to do it. You could have it in metal conduit, you could have it in non-metal conduit. You know all of that is acceptable. Um, then there are rules for where outside branch circuits go into the building. And generally speaking, those rules have to do with either the physical protection of the wires, such as uh, protecting them in metal, or it has to do with the temperature differential between the outside of the building and the inside of the building. And that is generally solved by sealing the inside of the uh, conductor. So as you'll see special rules highlight later on in National Code, Electric Code, uh, what can happen between a hot side of the building and the cold side of the building is you can simulate a little weather system inside your conduit. You can get condensation, you know, from cold air going to hot air. You can get condensation. And, and even though you might have a, a, a rain-tight conduit, it's not an airtight conduit. It's not a spaceship. So the air gets into the conduit and it goes from cold to hot. It can rain and get water into your rain tight conduit, not because rain is getting in, but just because, you know, humidity is getting into it. So there's, there's spray foams you, you spray into the conduit to block that airflow, to block that humidity from getting in. Um, you know, open conductor supports for when you do have conduit runs across the roof, there's rules and regulations governing the spacing for those supports. Uh, there's rules and regulations for, you know, when the cable is running up the building, how frequently you have to, to support it. Uh, and, and then there's clearance requirements for overhead conductors and cables so you know above the roof there's a eight foot clearance requirement for conductors running across the roof except for where the roof is subject to pedestrian traffic and then the spacing requirements are even higher than that and so uh you know solar pergolas are a, a nice concept but definitely run them through the permit office beforehand because I can see 
you know, uh, inspector saying, well, if that pergola is going to have people walking underneath it, normally the height requirement is eight feet. But because that's subject to pedestrian traffic, I, I think it's a, a much, I think we'll see it reference later on in the program but it's it's a, a much taller height requirement um except <laughs> you know it says your 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 cables have to be three feet from windows or doors or porches um you know you don't want someone to be able to open a window and stick their hand out and be able to grab onto a power line The exception being the very top window, you know, from the window at the very top of the building to the very top of the building, there might not be a three foot clearance. And so they say at the very top window, you can have the, the cables run closer to the top of the window. We're assuming that there's no one above you. And so, uh, you know, so we're, where we're assuming you're not going to get out that top window and, and monkey around with the very top of it. Um, mechanical protection of conductors on buildings or structures is deferred to a little bit later. Um, here's a one that is commonly overlooked if you just get to the solar specific sections is that raceways on exterior surfaces of buildings or structures shall be arranged to drain. So I like doing funky things with my solar racking in terms of using the, the solar rails and the grooves inside the solar rails themselves to, to arrange and tightly manage the cable. But when I'm doing that outside and I'm using my solar rails, uh, running it across the rooftop, I have to be cognizant of the fact that I don't want water to accumulate in the solar racking where my cables are also present. So I need to, uh, to make sure that whatever racking I'm using, if I'm using the rack to provide cable management for my cables, that the rack is not going to fill up with water and when it rains and submerge my cables. Instead, I need to uh, ensure that my rack is suitable for drainage uh, or relocate my, my modules. So in, in other words, I really like using um, a particular racking method that has a, a U channel in the, in the rail. And what happens is uh, you get a, a, a bolt and a lock nut that comes in, and this bolt is, is connected to a, a, a clamp system that comes in and, and clamps the module frame to the rail. And then sometimes, you know, depending on the project, I will go and put my cable inside this channel and run my solar cable into this channel to keep my cable tucked out of the way and that way it's protected from from birds and critters from chewing on it but i also have to be aware that water can get down into here and so i might modify my my rail you know, if it doesn't have a, a tilt to it, then I need to be putting drain holes into that rail for water to drain out the rail. You know, here's our, our raceway seal. Where a raceway enters a building or structure from underground, it should be sealed. That is a common code test requirement. You know, oh, you're running your... your solar cables through a refrigerated unit to a non-refrigerated space or in here from a colder underground to a warmer above ground you need to seal those transitions to prohibit uh the moisture inside that cable from causing rain 
So the number of supplies. So a building or structure uh, is only allowed to be served by one power supply with exceptions. You know, that emergency power system, the fire alarm system, may is allowed to have its own supply. You know, so I commonly see fire alarm systems tapped onto the conductors before they get to uh, the, the emergency main because you don't want the main breaker to flip and that turn off you know, the emergency power systems that are needed to do alarm alerts. You know, solar is allowed to have special, you know, locations for connection, uh, which we'll get into when we talk about interconnection. But we can see it kind of being uh, already specified in the non-solar section, just talking about energy supplies to the buildings. Um, you know, multiple occupancy buildings ha are allowed to have the power come in to the property at multiple points. Disconnecting means should be provided for the ungrounded conductors that supply or pass through a building or structure. Um, the location of those disconnects should be installed either inside or outside the, the building uh, in a readily accessible location. And so this is saying, look, if you have solar going into a building, you know, there needs to be a, a disconnect that's readily accessible for someone to be able to turn off where the power goes into that building. And most jurisdictions, and I even think 2020 code is heading this way. Um, will say, you know, what that is for is for someone, you know, the fire department comes out, they need to be able to de-energize the solar array from the rest of the building. So we want to have a disconnect switch that's that someone can just walk up to and turn the system off uh, in the, the name of safety. And so we got we got a, a definition of what accessible really means because of course you know we want the fire department to be able to de-energize the system in the name of safety, uh, but we might not want some punk kid coming in and doing the exact same thing. So where is the line drawn between what's accessible and not accessible? I mean this this knife switch disconnect requirement that's readily accessible on the side of the building, you also have to keep in mind that's a, a, a potential safety hazard as well because someone could go up to that switch and open it up and stick their hand in and electrocute themselves. So, you know, what's the, def what's the difference between, you know, too accessible versus what's code required? So something that's accessible admits a uh, close approach where you don't have to get through a locked door or a, a, a locked fence uh, to access it. Uh, capable of being removed or exposed without damaging the building or structure or finish or not permanently closed in by the building or structure. That's accessible. So. Uh, You know, something that is accessible means you don't have to climb a ladder to get to it. Uh, so readily accessible is something that, that can be quickly accessed. So readily accessible is generally defined as, you know, you can walk up to it and, and reach it from the outside of the building. Or if you have to go inside the building to reach it, it's right inside the building in an obvious location. So, you know, where the, the meter is, if the meter is on the side of a garage and the service panel is on the inside of the garage, you can put the disconnect switch right on the inside of the garage because it's going to be very apparent to the fire department that, 
you know, there's there's where the power goes into the building, and if we walk right inside, there's the disconnect switch to kill that power. Authorities having jurisdiction will often go a step beyond to say, okay, well, code allows you to put it on the inside of the building, but we want it to be on the outside of the building, no matter what. And generally, installers do too. You know, they like the equipment being mounted on the outside of the building so they can come and service your array without you having to be there. All right, so within site, you know, code says, uh, you know, equipment, the, the disconnect switch has to be within site of the equipment. Otherwise, you'll need two disconnect switches, one on each end. You know, so I, I did a design for uh, uh, an array where uh, the power comes into the property at the front of the property and it powers a barn. The solar array was on a barn that was, uh, you know, within sight from the where the power went into the property. And the local jurisdiction looked at the line diagram and they say, well, we want a disconnect switch out at the barn. And we also want a disconnect switch out at the front of the property and we are saying no you know that's not code required you know you can just have one disconnect switch because the barn where the solar is is within sight of both disconnect switch of the first disconnect switch and they said well you know we want it to be we they came back and said okay well that's code compliant but we're going to still require it anyway Yeah, but, but but what this is saying is your disconnect switch should be within sight of um, the equipment that it's disconnecting. Now, so uh, you know, means shall be provided for disconnecting all ungrounded conductors that supply or pass through a building or structure. So you need to have a disconnect switch when you're going from the array into the building. Uh, location, uh, you know, where the conductors come into the building, that's where the disconnect switch needs to be, but it also needs to be readily accessible. So, you know, generally we're putting the disconnect switch, um, you know, right where the meter is outside the building. And then we get to the maximum number of disconnect switches. So, you know, let's say we have multiple solar arrays connecting to one subpanel. The, the, the disconnecting means for each supply should consist of no more than six switches or six circuit breakers mounted in a, a single enclosure. So this is known as the, the six handle rule. And what this says is, you know, you can have a service panel that just has a bunch of load slots on it. Or you can have a service panel that has the breaker slots, and then it has a main breaker slot. And so what this says is, we need to come and completely de-energize uh, a switchboard by flicking no more than six disconnect switches at once. And so if I have a, a service panel, let's say I'm building a solar farm and I have, an, I have seven inverters And they're all taking up their three phase inverters. So they're all taking up three slots on my service panel. But I can I can go and buy a 40 slot service panel. So if I have seven inverters and they're taking up three slots each, that's 21 slots. I'm not really taking up the whole service panel for all of these. If I only connect six inverters onto this panel, 
I don't need a main breaker. But once I add that seventh inverter, then I have to flick seven supply handles to completely de-energize the service panel. And so code says seven is more than six. And so that's when you need a, a main breaker panel versus a uh, uh, main lug only with, you know, with no main breaker. So when you have more than six disconnect switches, that's when you need a main breaker. So you might look at a service panel that doesn't have a main breaker and say, well, when can you use that as opposed to a panel with a main breaker? The answer is when there's less than six breakers on that main lug only panel, you're just fine. If there's more than six breakers on that main lug only panel, then you're gonna need to have a main breaker up at the top of it. So your grouping of disconnects, uh, one or more additional disconnecting means for special cases uh, shall be installed remotely from the normal supply. Oh, what does that mean? Well, you think about it, if you have a gas generator supplying backup power to your building, it has a disconnect switch for that generator, and that disconnect switch is not by your main service panel. It's out where the, the generator is. You know, your, your solar array disconnect, you know, that's not right by your main service panel. It's at a, a separate point. And so they say these, these disconnect switches need to be grouped together, but a backup power disconnect or emergency power disconnect needs to be grouped separately from your normal power disconnect because the fire department, when they come out and they de-energize the building, uh, they need to be able to do it quickly, but they also need to not make a mistake. If you have a, a emergency power system that the rest of the building should be de-energized, but you don't want to de-energize uh, grandma's ventilator, uh, that disconnect switch for emergency power is located in a separate location than the other disconnect switches. And so like your solar disconnect switch, your battery disconnect switch um, are, are allowed, should be located separately from the disconnect for the main building, should be separated differently than the disconnect for that main breaker if they are supplying emergency power systems. You know, basically what that is to me is saying you do have some flexibility to uh, not have the disconnect be located right next to the uh, main panel board. You can locate it outside the building. Now, where a building or a structure has any combination of feeders, a permanent plaque or directory should be installed at each disconnect location indicating where the other disconnects are. You know, so uh, that's, that's uh, uh, sometimes you can get surprised at inspection where the inspector wants to see uh, an actual map of where all the disconnect locations are. That, but it makes sense. You know, you put it right by your, your utility meter, a map of where your solar disconnect is, if it's not within sight, if it's not right there, you know, if it's at a, if it's around the corner, you know, if there's two disconnects, if there's a disconnect for your battery system, a disconnect for your solar system, having a placard to tell the fire department what's going on is a code requirement. So, so what, what, constitutes a disconnect switch uh, needs to be a manual disconnect switch unless it's also hand operable. So uh, a motorized breaker uh, is only a valid 
disconnect switch if it can also be switched by hand. So sometimes you might have a contactor that is purely a digital control. So I might put my solar array on a digital control contactor so I can press a button and turn my solar array off. Uh, the code says that doesn't qualify as the disconnect. You can do that, but you're gonna have to have a manual switch on top of that. Uh, to, to constitute your disconnect switch. That's a, a very American thing is to have these manual switches. In other countries, they they kind of opt for digital controls um, and it's just a different style of doing things, I suppose. The, you know, the disconnect needs to indicate whether it's open or closed. So, I'm building a battery bank and it's a custom job and I need to buy a battery disconnect and I find one that is a, a knob switch that that does a quarter turn and it turns to the right. You know, my problem is it's really designed for a, a like a marina battery for a boat you know, to disconnect the battery from the boat. You put this little switch there. Yeah, you know, the problem with that switch, that's a handle that just turns to the right, is the switch that I had, it didn't indicate whether or not the, uh, the switch was opened or closed. And you might think, well, okay, well, that should be kind of obvious. <laughs> if you have a, a battery, so here's our battery, positive and negative, and then I have cables coming off of this battery and they're they're landing on my bus bar. Yeah, 215. And so here's my, my positive bus bar and my negative bus bar and I put a, a switch on both sides. I turn the switch and it should kill voltage to the bus bar, right? Well, not necessarily because I might have other power sources on that bus bar, like a, a charge controller. So I go to my battery bank and I turn the switch and I go and I check the voltage on my bus and I still have voltage on my bus. And so it's very hard to determine without this disconnect being visually indicating whether or not the switch is in an open or closed position. So as a solar installer, I can get upset with jurisdictions that come in and mandate the use of a knife switch that has a handle that's either up or down for closed or, or open, but that's generally the convention. You know, I'll say that a, a breaker is visually indicating whether it's open or closed, but in the eyes of code, that breaker needs to be going up or down rather than left versus right to, to visually indicate whether it's open or closed. And, and some jurisdictions will, for that reason, go above and beyond and say, you know, we just want to keep it simple. You got to use a knife switch for your disc solar disconnects because uh, that way we know it's going to be open or closed and we can open up the dead plate and we can see it being opened or closed. That's actually not part of National Electric Code at this time, but it's, it's uh, much more convenient. Than, than other kinds of disconnects as far as visually indicating. Uh, at a bare minimum, your disconnects need to indicate whether or not they're in an open or closed position. Most inverters now do have little handles that do disconnecting uh, that are just open or closed, but there's a visual marker on them that tells you which way to turn it is whether or not it's open or closed. It, it has a little sight indicator that uh, informs you of it. Uh, minimum ratings of disconnects. The minimum disconnect for a single circuit is 15 amps. For two circuits is 30 amps. Uh, minimum size for a single family home is 100 amps. Uh, you know, electrically operating disconnect means, you know, generally up is on, down is off. 
Um, you know, here's a, a substation warning that says we want a permanent legible single line diagram whenever you're being connected to a high point of voltage. You know, that's in a, a substation, you know, when you're messing around with electricity going from very high voltage, utility voltage, down to, to circuit or uh, from the utility point of view, power line voltage or distribution circuit voltage. Um, so that becomes a, a common jurisdictional requirement on commercial projects where not only do they want a directory that shows where the disconnect switch is, but they also want a single line diagram that shows how the, the high voltage solar is connecting through the inverter into the service panel. So you might, as a solar guy, if you just stick to section 690, the solar section, then you, the, the local jurisdiction hits you up with all these labeling requirements that aren't in 690. There are basis for requiring disconnect placard directories and single line di diagram placard directories in other parts of National Electric Code. And it doesn't take that much of a stretch of an imagination for a jurisdiction to say, well, we require it in our substations, so we're also going to require it at these homes where, you know, they, we're not just talking about 240 volt circuits, but we're talking about 600 volt, and there's products out there that can do 1,000 volt or even 1,500 volts, so we just want to know what's going on. And so the same requirements for our substations we're going to go above and beyond national electric code and also require for our residential households uh the number of services you know special conditions we already talked about that for feeders but now we're into electric services you're allowed to have you know solar and parallel production systems feed into the house Uh, one building or structure is not to be supplied through the interior of another building or structure. And so they immediately define what, what the interior of a building is or is not. And so if you have concrete vaults between floors of the building, you can feed from one building to the next. Uh, you know, if your concrete slab is more than two inches, which they normally are, you can go under them. Uh, You know, when you're when you're not going through a slab, but you want a direct burial, you know, uh, at least 18 inches in conduit. Some jurisdictions will require more than that. Um, you know, conductors in the same raceway or cable are not allowed for services except for grounding conductors and bonding conductors and other conductors associated with the energy component system, such as uh, relay conductors or monitoring conductors. You know, what that means is if I have a, a service supplying a branch circuit, I can't just tap on a solar array wherever I want. So I'm talking about a... a um, a solar array, we're running an AC line for the inverter output, and they're also installing an air conditioning system. They say, hey, can we run the air conditioner and the solar array off of the same AC line? And the answer is no. You know, you have to land a distribution box there and pull a separate branch circuit for the AC line and a separate branch circuit for the solar array. Now, the, the feeder between the main panel and the sub panel can share solar and loads because it's a dedicated feeder between point A and point B. And there's nothing but a breaker on the first side and on the other side but it has to land on a distribution panel and then pull out your separate load circuits from your supply circuits. You can't just be daisy chaining an air conditioner unit and a solar array on the same branch circuit. 
You know, and then we see another requirement for the raceway seal. And so this is, you know, we've we've talked about Section 200 and established a lot of definitions and, and explanations. But what we see in the, the next section is a lot of the requirements that we just saw for feeders, such as a raceway seal between the building from underground to above ground, it just repeats for services because the same principle applies. And so that's, you know, where you get into uh, more fine-tuned rules and conditions in the later sections, you'll often see the, the, the theory for it built in the earlier section. So that's kind of the, the theme I wanted to get into today. Um, as we go into tomorrow, we're going to be talking uh, much more specifically about balance of system selection like conduit and fittings and cable jackets. Uh, and then the second half of tomorrow, we'll be getting into the, the solar and battery specific sections of National Electric Code. So again, we're still just in the early sections of National Electric Code. Starting off tomorrow, we're going to go much faster and really just highlight some, some common gotchas. Uh, but remember, when you actually open up your, your code book, you know, the, the first three sections of code are, you know, the, the first 80% of the, the code book. <laughs> it was a good long presentation. Um, just, you know, the first 80% of code is, is uh, you know, section 200. By the time you get out of section 200, you're, you're halfway through your code book already. <laughs>